Uh, as you already said, my name is Andrew Smith. Um, it's good to be back with you. I was here uh, a couple of Sunday, oh, a couple of Sundays ago, a year ago. That was several Sundays ago. Uh, but I'm excited to be back, and there's so many familiar faces that I met, and, and now, of course, I've forgotten your name. <laughs> but not everyone. Uh, but if I have to ask your name again, I'm sorry, but I do remember your face, and I do remember your kindness, uh, and I do remember how, what a great audience you were. Uh, so I'm just thankful to have the opportunity to be back and, and to share a message with you. It, I don't know if there's anything else I need to tell you that uh, you need to know about me. Uh, Chris Davis is my cousin. Uh, so, is that Clint right there? Clint and Chris are my cousins, and apparently they're here. If this sermon doesn't go well, you can go beat them, because uh, they're my kin. So, that's something you can know about me, I guess. Uh, what I want to share with you, for the time I have with you tonight, is something that seems to be very, very difficult to do. And I know that it is difficult sometimes to forgive our brother and our sister when they hurt us or they wrong us in some way, but there's one person that is awfully hard to forgive. And that person is you and that person is me. That person is yourself, isn't it, sometimes? And we understand what the blood of Jesus can do for us, and we understand what remission of sins is, but even though we look back and we think, man, why did I do the things I used to do? And it hurts. And what we end up doing is we end up holding on to all this guilt, and what I believe it does is it stunts our spiritual growth. Because we're holding on and we are forgetting and we do not know how to forgive ourselves. Now, thankfully for us, God has helped us figure this out through his word. And that's what I'll be sharing with you tonight. I want to kind of illustrate what I mean by forgiving yourself. And I think the reason why it's so difficult to forgive ourselves, it seems to be a negative effect. Guilt is a negative effect of a lot of spiritual growth. And this is what I mean by this. And I practiced this in my apartment uh, before I came over here. But this is the idea as I'm here and I'm in sin. And maybe whatever it is that you can think of yourself that you've done in your past. Maybe here I I stole. I I lived a life of thievery. Maybe here I committed adultery. I was sexually immoral. Uh, I was a hateful person. Anything that you could put in your situation, this is where you were. This is when you were dead in your sin. But thankfully you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. You reacted to it the way you were supposed to, and Jesus Christ healed you. He forgave you from your sins, so you started growing. And as you grew, you grow closer and closer to God. Now, of course, there's going to be bumps in this road. You're going to fall down. There's going to be times when you're going to sin again. You're going to stop. You're going to have to repent. You're going to have to pray about it, and the Lord's going to raise you up again. And you keep on growing. And you keep on growing, and you keep on growing. And what we do sometimes is by the time we get here, we're not focused on God anymore anymore but we start looking behind us. And what it is, is we're amazed at first how far we've grown. Wow, I have really come a long way. Wow, I have really grown spiritually a lot. But sometimes that turns into guilt. Wow, I can't believe I used to live the way I used to live. Wow, how could I possibly do the things I used to do? How could I possibly hurt my God like I hurt Him? I used to hurt Him. And it hurts And the biggest problem is right here, is when we're sitting here and we're looking back, that's the problem. We're looking back. And what have our eyes left? God. And that becomes the problem because we're so focused on how we used to be, we forget about what's ahead of us. And that can stunt our spiritual growth. I want us to turn to Psalm 32 if you haven't already done it. Psalms 32, this is his thesis statement, basically in verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. And in these whose spirit there is no deceit. Impute there is just a fancy word for to do, but it's always a negative thing. So what it is, is the man whose transgressions are forgiven, he is blessed. He is blessed. So if you, no matter what you used to do in your old life, if you have been forgiven of your sins, you are blessed. And this is how he proves it. Verse 3, he shows us that ignoring our guilt was never a solution. It was never solved the problem. Verse 3, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. So when I tried to ignore my sin and I was silent, my bones grew old and I groaned because it never solved the problem. 
Ignoring our guilt has never solved the problem. Now for here, the guilt was constructive. Whose hand was heavy on our hearts? In this verse, verse 4. It's the Lord's hand that's heavy. And what it is, is the Lord is being constructive with this guilt because He's trying to push you towards the solution, which is verse 5. I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So we prayed, and we told God about our transgressions, and He forgave us. Skipping down to verse 11. Verse 11 says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright of heart. So this is the effect of all of this. You didn't ignore your sin and said you did something about it. You were constructive with it. You prayed to God. You asked for forgiveness. He gave you forgiveness. And now this, verse 11, I don't think is a suggestion. I think it's a command. Be glad in the Lord. Shout for all joy. You're supposed to be happy and realize, wow, God has done this for me. He has forgiven me. Now I am blessed. Verse 1. So this is what we're talking about. Now the problem is, is we get stuck right here, don't we? We go ahead, we handle the solution, we do what we need to do to seek forgiveness, but we cannot, for some reason, move on to the be glad part. And that could be a host of different reasons, and it may be different for everybody. It may be that we're just comfortable, maybe with our guilt. Maybe we've held on to our guilt for so long that it's become comfortable, and maybe we may think we may feel worse if we drop that guilt if we're past verse 5. Maybe it's just for some reason uh, you've just so ashamed that you just don't know what to do about it, and you just are totally, you feel like you are out of control. I don't know what it is, but I know that you need to be doing verse 11. And this is what I'm going to try to show you some passages in the Word that might help you with that uh, tonight. One thing I need to say before I get really into this, I I guess I already am into this, but a little bit more into this. This sermon is not for somebody that has not put on Christ yet. Because if you have not put on Christ yet, you do need to hold on to your guilt. Because hopefully, and hopefully that you will uh, be able to understand this and accept this and move this, hopefully your guilt can still be constructive and lead you to put on Christ through baptism. So if you haven't put on Christ yet, you have no way to lose that guilt. This is available for His own. Now, thankfully, you can become one of His own, right? His invitation is always offered. But this is something for us that have already put on Christ. And that's the way I'll be looking at it. I'll reflect that at the end. What I need to point out first is this is a solution to all of this, and it doesn't work unless you do this. You have to pray. Prayer must be a key part to stop looking back and start looking ahead, to drop our guilt. We already got that in verse 5. Verse 32, 5, I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. What's interesting about this verse is there is a New Testament parallel that fits with this verse perfectly. And that verse is 1 John. 1 John 1. 1 John 1, 9. Got up here on the screen or you can turn there. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Is not this the same verse almost? So you confess your transgressions to God. You admit to God the things you've done. You seek His help. And what does He do? He is faithful. He is faithful and just to forgive you of those sins. This is his promise. And it's something he promised in the Old Testament, now something he's promising in the New. And it shows you those righteous principles that we read about in the Old Testament were carried on into the New Testament, weren't they? We had this avenue as well. Now, back in Psalms 32, it gives us what we should do because we understand this. We understand that God is faithful to forgive us of our sins. So verse 6 of chapter 32 of Psalms explains the effect. For this cause, because you understand that God's faithful to forgive you, for this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. So for this cause, everyone who is godly, in our case, everyone who is put on Christ, They will come to you when they need help, God. 
and they will come to you, and because you are faithful, even if they're surely as flooded by great waters, they're not going to come near you, because God keeps his promises. And this promise here is to forgive you of your transgressions. That is awesome. That is wonderful. This is the only thing that anything as I got to completely rephrase that. This is the only God that you can ever read about that can do something like this, that will promise you something like this, that you will have your transgressions blot out. And for those of us that are godly, all you have to do is ask. All we all have to do is be willing to make the change in here, and we need to communicate with him and ask. What I want to do now is I just want to give you, ask you three questions. So maybe you're somebody that is, feel the guilt. Maybe you're somebody that's here, and you're still looking back, and you are praying. Andrew, I pray all the time. Andrew, I pray, please, Lord, help me forget about these things. Please, Lord, I feel like I'm in so much distress constantly. Please help me. So maybe if you're someone already that is praying, I want to give you some more things that you can pray about. And that's James 5. James 5, 13, if you want to turn there. This is where we get the famous line, the, the righteous man's prayers avail much. But James gives you some more solutions, maybe some more ways that you can be prayerful to help you be healed. This passage uses the phrases sick and healed, and I believe in the spiritual context. So when he's talking here about when you're sick or when you need to be healed, this is a spiritual healing. Or maybe you're spiritually sick, and these are guaranteed solutions for that. I want to just skip down to verse 14. If anyone among you is sick... Let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you might be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails months. And he goes on to give Elijah as an example of something like that. But what it is, is it offers you things that you can do prayerfully if you're spiritually sick. If you're spiritually discouraged, or maybe even you're still holding on to sin, one thing you can do is you can ask your elders to come and pray for you. And the Lord will raise you up. Another thing you can do in verse 16 is you can confess your trespasses to a brother or sister. And they can pray for you. And you again will be healed. These are the power of prayer. And this is what James 5 is showing to us. So basically, if you're trying to remove your guilt and you're not praying, it's not going to work. That's the reason why I made this whole point. If you are not praying about it, none of this is going to work. Let me now move into three questions. Three questions you can ask yourself. If you are already praying, you're already doing the things in James 5, but for some reason you're still holding on to guilt. That's in Hebrews 9. Just flip back one book over. (coughs) In Garndale, I only have to preach one time every Sunday. Me and Terry Benton flip-flop. I'll do Sunday morning, then he does Sunday night. This is one of the rare occasions when I preach twice in a Sunday. And I guess I'm not as trained as Mr. Bob is. My voice feels like this. It's like, my, like someone's got me around the throat. But this is new. But I'm still so happy I get an opportunity to do it. Uh, Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. Here we use this passage to explain why the blood of bulls and goats weren't good enough and why we needed the blood of Jesus Christ to heal us in the new covenant. Verse 12, Hebrews 9, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of the heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant, by means of death for the redemption of transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. That we see here that Jesus wants to cleanse our conscience with his blood. Verse 13 I found really interesting. For the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of the heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies the purifying the flesh. Why would the Hebrews wider bring up the ashes of the heifer? What does that mean? 
Now, if we go back to numbers, we can see what it means. Back in the old law, if you touch something dead, something that was dead out in the woods or someone that was dead, you had to go through a process to become clean again. So you were unclean when you touched it. You were unclean for seven days. Then you had to do something. You had to get those ashes of the heifer from the tabernacle and somehow mix in water and sprinkle it on you, and then you would be clean. And this is why he's bringing this up in verse 13 of Hebrews 9. 9, 13 of Numbers says, Whoever in the open field touches one who is slain by a sword or who has died or a bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean seven days. And for an unclean person, they shall take some of the ashes of the heifer, burnt for purification from sin, and running water shall be put on them in a vessel. So if you touch something dead, you are unclean. And so when you had the ashes of the heifer after seven days, you were clean. Now, what's interesting about this and what I was thinking about, it was difficult about because none of us are Jews and we don't practice this today. But what it was is there were certain things you couldn't do when you were unclean. And it was almost like you kind of stood out from the Israelites' society when you were unclean. So you wanted these ashes of heifer. You wanted the ashes of the heifer. You wanted the seven-day period to be up so you basically could return and do everything like you were already doing. You were clean. You were unclean, and now you're clean. Now, what he relates it to us is, is this is what God, Jesus, did for us. Not the ashes of the heifer, but he cleansed our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So not so much that we touched something dead, but we did dead works. And what are our dead works? It's our sin. It's our transgressions. And what does Jesus do for us? The power of the blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience, our mind, the thing in our head that tells us what's right and what's wrong. It cleanses us. Now, the ashes of the heifer couldn't do it. It wasn't good enough. But Jesus' blood was good enough. So let me ask you this question. If you're holding on to guilt and you don't let your conscience be cleansed, is the blood of Jesus good enough? I'd tell you it was. And I believe many people here will tell you that it is. It doesn't matter how bad you used to be. The blood of Jesus is good enough. And it can cleanse your conscience. What is it here in this passage? Why did Jesus cleanse our conscience? For what purpose? And that's the next phrase. To serve the living God. He cleansed us that we may serve. Going back to my analogy when we were standing over here and I was walking around. If I am so focused on my dead works, what am I not doing? I'm not truly serving the living God to my full potential, am I? And what it is is my focus is so much on the things that are dead that I'm not thinking about the thing right in front of me that's alive, which is God. That would be a big problem if I'm not serving what's alive because I'm so focused on what's dead. I think maybe some of us don't get the Old Testament analogy, and that's understandable. I don't feel like I really get it because we're not Jews and we don't live in that society. It just doesn't really make sense to us. What I think a lot of us know about is being a little kid and getting muddy. So we go outside, and of course, obviously, I was once a little boy. And I lived at home with my parents. And what I loved to do on a Saturday was go outside and just go move dirt. I mean, I just remembered the fondness of just like, you know what? I'm going to go outside, and you see that dirt right there. I'm going to put it on my Tonka truck, and I'm going to move it over there. And all I'm doing is moving dirt, and I'm loving it. I'm loving every minute of it. Now, what you do is, if you, when you were little, and you used to play in dirt, and you used to get muddy, and you got home, and I still hear this woman's voice. But you come in, and you step in through the door, and you step on the floor mat, and what does she start screaming at you? Don't you dare touch a thing. Don't you dare move, Andrew. And I'm holding like this, right? I can't touch a thing because all I know is it is as much as I even bump on a wall, I get mud on a wall, I get mud on the table, I get mud on the floor. What do I do? I'm the one that's going to end up cleaning it. And if it's really bad, I might get whipped because mama took cleaning that seriously. It was a big deal. So I'm walking through the house like this, right? You have to run to the bath because she tells you to. You go take a shower. And when you come out of the shower, what is she going to get you to do? She's going to get you to do something else, right? Because it never ends. She always has something more for you to do. This is our mamas. And what it usually was is she calls you in because she wants you to set the table. She wants you to help with dinner somehow. Because you're a good child, you obey her. Now, what could you not do when you were still muddy? You couldn't go help your mother in the kitchen, could you? Because you were unclean. You were muddy. You couldn't go help her set the table because you were muddy. You couldn't go serve 
Because you were filthy. Now what Jesus has done for us is he has made us clean so that we might serve. And when I'm clean, I can go serve. I'm not walking around like this anymore. I'm doing stuff. And in that case, you're doing stuff for your parents. In this case, we're doing stuff for our God. Second question. Do you have confidence in our God? 1 John 3, 9, 3.18, parallel passage to this. 1 John 3, <clears throat> me and Terry have been studying this book together on Tuesdays. And I always thought this was just the love book. But you know, the book that talks about how God is love. But there is just so much in this book. And I feel like my mind's just been opened up. I think people at Garndale are getting sick of me because I keep on using verses out of 1 John over and over again. But in 1 John, he's explaining a situation where a congregation must have split. And the people that left wanted to teach people that Jesus didn't come in the flesh. And that's wrong. So what John is doing in 1 John is he is trying to reassure the people that stayed that they were in the right. Y'all did right. Y'all stayed like y'all were supposed to. Y'all were right. Jesus did come in the flesh. I need now to assure you that this is the case. And this is one of the ways he assures them in verse 18. Verse 18, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth, and it shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing to God. And this is a commandment that we should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now, if he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him, and by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. And I want to mainly focus on this verse, verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. What's interesting is usually when we talk about following our heart, we usually say it in a bad sense. When we go to Jeremiah and we talk about how the heart is so deceitful and it can lead you away. And that's true. What's interesting about this passage is it flips it. It says if your heart does not condemn you, that's because you have confidence in God. So we have to understand the context, and that's why I kind of explain what 1 John is all about for this verse to make sense. So these are people that are already godly. They're already following the commandments of God. They're already doing what they need to do. They stayed when those that want to teach false doctrine left. Doctrine left, And he's saying, because your heart does not condemn you, you don't feel the guilt. It's not that you've never done anything bad in your whole life. It's not that you've ever been guilty of sin. What it is, is you have confidence in God. You have confidence in God. Now, what is the thing that we would have so much confidence in? We've already read the passage. It's back to chapter 1. He is faithful. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I have confidence in God because he said that he will forgive me. He will forgive me because he is faithful. And if I truly am seeking him and I get his salvation through Jesus Christ and I talk to him and I repent and I want to make the change, he is faithful to forgive me. So what I needed to be doing is thinking, you know what, my heart maybe should not be condemning myself the way that it is because of how great my God is. And because I have confidence that when God says he's going to do something, that he's going to remember your deeds no more, he's going to do it. Because God cannot lie. He always keeps his promise. Promises we need to have confidence in God. Because it's who he is. Even if you feel like your heart still condemns you. And I don't want to make and come up here and act like all this stuff's easy. Uh, because it's not easy. It isn't. But with God's help, we can do it. But verse 20 goes into the other side. If your heart condemns us, if your heart actually does condemn us, guess what? God is greater than our heart. So even if your heart is still condemning you and you think, man, you know what? I, I've just done so many awful things. I, I committed adultery once. I, I stole this thing before. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And you just don't think your heart will ever stop condemning you. Verse 20 tells you that God is bigger than your heart. God is bigger than your problems. 
God is bigger than your sin. God is bigger than your transgressions. And he's provided you every avenue to get out. We need to have confidence in God. And number one, understand the blood of Jesus. Third question. This is my last question. So you can kind of relieve. Like, okay, we're, we're winding up. I'm going to be relieved because of this throat. I have no clue. This is ridiculous. Y'all that know me know how much I can talk. And for some reason tonight, I'm trying to talk. And it's just not coming out. But I thank you so much for uh, bearing with me with this. Can you press on towards Christ? This is my third and final question. So if you continue to hold on to the things that you're holding on to in your past, can you truly press on towards Christ? We haven't covered them yet, but in Acts 22, Paul recounts how guilty he is of the things he used to do. So he recounts his story to the angry not mob. This was right before the scripture reading we did here. Right before that, he's accounting it to the Jewish angry mob. And he says that Ananias said, why are you waiting? Come and be baptized. Arise, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And then he goes in the temple in Jerusalem to pray in the next scene. Jesus appears to him in a vision and he says, Lord, those here in Jerusalem won't accept me. And what he basically does is start going on a guilt trip. I used to drag the people out in synagogues, your people. I even watched and stood by as they killed your faithful martyr, Stephen. These are the things I used to do. And what's interesting about that is that Jesus doesn't even acknowledge the stuff he talks about. Jesus just says, okay, well then I'll send you to the Gentiles. So Jesus has a solution right off the bat. But Paul, who did all the awful things he did, can write something later like this. Philippians 3, not that I am already have attained or am already perfected, but I press on. That I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What I loved about this verse is this perfectly explained what we talked about at the very beginning. This is our analogy. This is what this is, that he could walk, he could spiritually grow, and what he would do is he would forget about the things that are behind so that he might reach forward. And what is he reaching for? He's reaching for the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So what we can do, because Paul did it, is he forgot the things in the past so that he might reach forward. So that he could press on towards Jesus Christ. And when we're looking so back and we're trying to hold on those things, our hands are in the wrong place. Our hands are going to be reaching this way towards God. And this is what the problem is with guilt. One thing that I think helped me so much when I was reading this passage is that I'm not alone in experiencing guilt. I'm not alone in that. That there are things that I've done in my life that I wish that I had not have done. I'm not alone in experiencing guilt. And one person I know who did understand what guilt was is this guy, Paul. He understood and he experienced it. And guess what? He did something about it. He dealt with it. He forgot the things from the past with the help of Jesus so that he might press forward. So you are not alone. It is not easy to forgive yourself, but with the help of Jesus Christ, you can do it. So that you may press forward closer to him. You are not alone. So just a recap. We talked about praying. We talked about understanding the power of the blood of Jesus. We talked about having confidence in God. And here, we're just talking about pressing on towards Christ. These are things that will be so much helpful if we could learn how to forgive ourselves. I thank you so much for your attention. Uh, this is one thing I like coming by here is y'all is so attentive. Like I feel like everyone's eyes on you, and that's not me. That's you. Uh, that just means you like to be engaged and you like to worship together. So thank you so much uh, for letting me come and worship with you tonight. I feel like I know at least the characteristics of this congregation. And to ask the fourth question, if I had one, would be Ananias' question in Acts 22. Why are you waiting? If you understand that you're in guilt and that guilt's being constructive on your heart, because that's God's hand on your heart, Jesus wants to help you with that. And I know that this congregation here wants to connect you with him so he might heal you on that. If there's anything that this congregation can do for you, whether it be uh, to pray for you, whether it be study with you, or even to be baptized into Christ to put on him, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.